Well, hello everybody and welcome back to day two, two and a half or so. <laughs> we have a lot to cover here because obviously this is a very timely topic. So we're, we're going to dive in a bit and I think we have an interesting array of people from different parts of the industry here on stage. So we're going to jump around and try to cover as much as we can in, you know, 15, 20 minutes here. But um, I'm just going to start with you, Chris. You know, obviously whistleblowing has been, you know, uh, very in the news with Francis Haugen the last, you know, month or two. Um, you were one of the first to come out and talk about everything that's been going on with Facebook early on with Cambridge Analytica years ago, and uh, I remember reporting on that at the time. How does that feel, you know, a few years later to see where the industry has come, where the, the, the data privacy discussion has come uh, since then? Your mic's think, not working. I think your mic might be off, yeah. Well, do we have a, maybe a spare mic or something like that? But um, <laughs> we're, we're going to come back to that then in, in a quick second. I want to circle back around. Um, oh. Actually, one moment. Technical difficulties. <laughs> it's a tech conference. <laughs> no, it's great. There, does that work? Oh. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Well, OK. Um, so uh, I, I think in terms of my whistleblowing, it sort of, I think, helps mainstream a conversation about data protection and privacy. In terms of where we are in the, the sort of debate, I mean, with the new whistleblowing, it feels like deja vu. Uh, really, for me personally, deja vu, like Senate hearings and all this. And we're just talking about the same thing over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, I think we're sort of stuck in this loop. And I think one of the problems is it's clear that there's a lot of problems, um, and those are constantly being discussed. But we sort of are missing a conversation about solutions and frameworks for regulation and industry practice. So, so it's, uh, that's a good point. It's interesting to see kind of where the industry has come and, and also, like I said, not come since then. You know, like I said, it feels like a cyclical cycle. Uh, Carolina, I know that um, you know, NIAX has been thinking a lot about um, on the ad tech front, how do you kind of go beyond to give companies a better solution that protects data but also um, keeps publishers and everything else, you know, monetized through advertising? Well, as you know, and we've talked about this before, what NIAX has is it's a compliance system. So we, all, we work with people that are compliant in their privacy aspects, and we make sure of that through um, looking at their, all, their full technology stack and also with certain waivers that are in. So we're working with publishers that um, are direct and also with programmatic that are adhering to all privacy standards. So we're not taking basically, it's a more curated market, and we're not taking many of the mom and pops that are looking at the broad spectrum of the advertising industry. So in a very curated market, you can create that sort of transparency for the agency and advertiser. Sure. Uh, Brendan, uh, you know, you're at Mozilla, is one of the founders of that before, uh, starting Brave. Um, so obviously Mozilla has been also one of the browsers that's been pushing for privacy as an, as an organization as well, and you're doing the same as with Brave too, but tell us a bit about the way that you're thinking about founding companies and organizations right now, and, and how has that gotten traction over the last couple of years? Yeah, Brave um, started in 2015 in stealth mode, but I was talking to a lot of people in New York mainly about um, ad tech. I talked to publishers. Um, I talked to Jim Spanfeller, who used to be the Forbes publisher. <laughs> he said, you should block everything. So we did, um, because we realized that my creation from 1995, my bad millennial JavaScript, had turned into sort of a, a monster. It was used to track everybody, and it was used to arbitrage and do ad exchange, mainly through Google, in a way that wasn't helping publishers enough. It had a lot of fraud problems for advertisers. So Brave cut out that huge middle player section, and we do direct ad sales, we do ad matching privately in the browser, no data collection. The, it's not an exchange, it's just a, a catalog every day that's updated with offers and matched against your data feeds in your browser. Everyone has them when you browse. All your browsers know about you, but it's all local. And then we use cryptographic protocols to confirm the ad impressions. So we built something that was out there on the extreme end, other browsers and platforms are moving toward where we are. So it's been easier over time. When we started, it was very difficult. We were either, they were going to call security on us because we blocked ads by blocking tracking, or they, they said, well, you know, can't you just give me better deals and get those people who block ads to let my ads through? 
And we do have a way to do that, but it's based on consent. If we, if we tried to do it the way it's done, we wouldn't have any scale, and we wanted to do it privately and with consent. So the world has moved toward that. It's been gratifying, but it's taken six years, you know. Yeah. And um, uh, Diana, so with Constellation, you, you've been on, on the SaaS side of this. And uh, tell us a bit more about what you guys have been building. Yeah, so we have a SaaS technology that makes thousands of creative designs programmatically. Uh, we believe that the future of creative is really done through feeding systems. And because Google and Facebook has already gone that way, uh, integrations to Snapchat, Twitter, uh, as well as Pinterest are happening now. Um, I think that one of our frustrations in the area of data privacy is that I believe that transparency clears all conflicts. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, currently with iOS 14 changes and iOS 15 changes, um, we're all being asked, do you want tracking? And at the end of the day, that's not the question that should be being asked right now. Uh, people are not asking you whether you want advertising. You're getting advertising whether you want it or not. It's basically, do you want personalized advertising or do you want broad advertising? And so transparency would be more so asking, do you want personalized advertising or broad advertising? But that's not how it's actually presented. And I believe that the future of all of this is that the big techs are only getting bigger because more data is being captured by them that no longer becomes sellable data to anyone else out there. And what does that mean? That means Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook all get bigger with data and smaller companies can never catch up into the data aspects of things. And in the end, Apple can now say, hey, I have an advertising platform and if you want to basically use first party data of Apple, then you now have to advertise with us. So that's the transparency that's not being said right now, and it is frustrating being a, a third-party partner watching this. Yeah. So thinking about transparency, and you brought up some good questions. Yeah. You know, where it's you know, uh, you know, people want to, have, and some some people want to have personalized ads. Some people have, want to have no ads. Uh, and but the, the the education thing seems to be lacking. If you're looking at the average person doesn't want to read, you know, pages and pages of. Uh, you know, consent forms for every website they go to. You know, but um, so it's, it seems like a lot of people are either going to just quickly say no, and other people are going to say, "Sure, I trust this place." You know, um, but Chris, when you're thinking about uh, just the role of transparency and the role of the education, you know, obviously Cambridge Analytica brought a lot of this to light. Uh, we've seen in the last month or two with different issues, but some similar issues with with uh, with Facebook and the Facebook Papers. Uh, another, just yesterday, you know, there was a European commissioner that was here. She was talking about how whistleblowers like yourself and Francis Haugen helped to show the need for regulation and, uh, and, and why, uh, w if people weren't talking about it, these things get so in the weeds. And so I'm kind of curious, what do you think when you're thinking about the transparency education part of this? So, <clears throat> can people hear me? Is it on now? It's yeah, on it's now. on. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I think that, uh, with respect, the, the, the conversation around transparency completely misses the point. Because in no other sector do we put the onus on consumers to understand incredibly intricate technological constructions. You know, you, you don't, when you, when you go onto an airplane or you take a drug or, you know, there's no terms and conditions and actually you don't know what's in the drug that your doctor is prescribing you, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a, there's a competent regulator that looks at a framework of safety and what's in the best interest of people. And so I think when it comes to um, regulatory frameworks or what we can start to, to think about, rather than putting the onus on the end user, we should come up with a standard set of, as, if you'd like, social terms and conditions that we as a society agree with. This is appropriate, this is not appropriate. So that, because realistically, users opt into stuff that they have no idea what they're opting into. Even if they say they want personalized advertising, they don't actually know what that actually means specifically in terms of the, the, where their data actually goes. And it's unreasonable to expect that the average person should know that. So I think when we're looking at regulatory frameworks, looking at what's in the consumer's best interest, what is choice enhancing engineering, what is you know, going to respect the integrity and agency of the user, and what would a reasonable person expect to happen if they agreed. And setting that out in a regulatory framework I think would be very helpful. Sure. Uh, 
She's like, I couldn't tell that the applause is from here or some, some other room. Yeah, Marty, but it's, it's a very good point. Marty, yeah, can I answer to that? Yeah, go for it. I, with respect over here, I totally agree with many of the things that you've said over there for the downflow of data. But what I disagree with is that somebody's going to come up with a, with a social construct of what I want for my data. Because my data is personal. And having a regulatory body come in, and I'm just looking at the US laws, that's the only place that I am an expert in on that, that piece for privacy, is that none of the regulatory frameworks are looking at the personalization in that ma manner. Not, at the on the, not on the federal level and not on the state level. So that is not something, at least in the United States, right. anywhere else I'm not going to make that uh, distinction on, but it has to be for the individual because right, we about, are individuals. But what about the social harms that come from it? So when you I, look at I the, no, you, but, well, yes. if you like. Yes. So you can, you can individu individualize the issue, but like for example, if I'm an insurance company, you opt in, to, for me to use your data and I use it to create something that ends up taking somebody's health care away, right? That harms someone else. When you, when you opt into Facebook and you agree for Facebook to use their data and that creates algorithms that then deceive other people, there is a social impact. So I think when we're talking about data, we can't just think about an individualization of it because data is put into an, a system which has uh, downstream effects. But listen to me. But the the, the idea that you just brought up, the idea that you just brought up is actually governed in the United States under separate laws. One of which is it's lending laws. Though. There are other laws that actually deal with that that are not privacy centric that are already in place. So, so, so why, why is Facebook allowed to get away with what it does then? I'm not saying that we're, we're making if, it about Facebook. But if when you're saying that there's a regulation. Just, uh, <laughs> it there's, should there's, be about everything in yeah. general. And it, this is not about that. And I know that you have very personal ideas on it. But to make a construct that we're going to look at and we're going to say under specific social norms, whose social norms? Who, what's the government? Where is that? I would like well, other the, people to talk the, about this. That's so the well. nature of a democracy, though. Yeah. There's a debate and that we as a society come to the conclusion that we do. That's literally the essence of democracy. Yeah, Brendan, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, because thinking about the browser level, right? You have the Apple, you have Facebook, you have these things that people can at least sort of choose to opt, you know, even there's the shadow profiles and stuff like that with Facebook, but, uh, you know, at the browser level, you know, um, Brendan, I'm kind of curious, because I, I think you guys both bring up interesting points, because it's, there is um, personalization, it's so broad, like everyone's going to want a different preference, and so there needs, in some ways, you know, some would say there needs to be a regulatory framework for that. But, you know, it's, when it gets so specific, it's hard to have something that's gonna protect everybody. I'm kind of curious, like Brendan, what do you think about the, the browser level? Because everyone's gonna enter a so lot of the internet all, through that. I, I agree with Chris that the abuses, especially with Facebook, but also Google, are so bad that there needs to be some kind of, uh, there, there is a reaction, and this reaction is going to have legal consequences. What's uh, important in law, which I think we all can agree to, whatever our individual preferences is, you cannot consent to something you don't understand. And you cannot understand being tracked by third parties exactly. with third parties on their back that are taking your data to some foreign land and selling it. There's no way to, to consent to that. You can't understand it. You can't consent to it. So our approach has been to block it. But we want, because we believe advertising is important to fund creators on the web, we want users to opt into private ads, and those are matched where your data originates. And there are limitations to that. You can't put all the data into Google's supercomputer and do double regression studies and find this person that sort of look alike for you, that bought something, and then you pitch that to you. That, that's not easy to do without privacy leakage. We do more individual personalized matching, and I think that's a better way to do it because users can understand it. Maybe in the fullness of time, there will be cryptographic protocols that don't leak data, federated learning, there'll be ways to get ideas about people like you that bought something you didn't buy that you might like to learn about without sending your entire data profile out. But that's over the horizon for us. Yeah. And I think where Facebook and Google operate is there, and that's why they're monopolies. And that's why what Diana said is true. They're consolidating, and that's an antitrust problem. That's not due to privacy regulation. Exactly. That's not due to little brave or ad blockers. That, that's due to them taking over markets by tying things together. And exactly. the only thing I would say is 
You can't ignore the fact that the big techs are going to get bigger. By all the restrictions that are going out there, they just continue to gather that data and nobody will actually end up catching up. Now, if I was a regulator, I would say, hey, if you basically won't sell that data to anybody else, you can't use the data yourself. That's a great Now, that is basically what I would do. It's like, if they can't use it, then maybe the approach that they would make in terms of actually collecting the data would be very different, and it would be for the greater good. I believe that is the solve. Because at the end, advertisements advertisers like myself will advertise on platforms that have the most users. At the end of the day, I think you guys have a really great profile and what you guys are doing is revolutionizing, but we all advertise on the big tech platforms. You, you can't right. avoid it because they're all <laughs> basically captured all like, of the users. But hold them responsible by asking them not to use the data if they don't sell that data anywhere else. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Google, and I've, and I've said this before, Google should be a utility for their data. If it is a utility, and it won't happen, but it would be nice. Yes. If it were a utility, then everybody can come in at a similar price, similar to AT&T with their telephone lines. And that is where Google is, uh, where AT&T was at one time. Yeah, go for it, yeah. The problem with that is that utilities are, are institutions that manage resources and you're treating people like a resource. Selling and, with, you know, where, where, is, where is the individual and where is the person's rights in this, in this construct that you're setting up with the utility. Utili using a utility is for water, electricity, et cetera, and implicit in what you're saying is that people can be treated like water or electricity. Not exactly, because so, it depends how Google is actually aggregating that data and selling it. And the way that they actually sell it down the stream, it's not on the, uh, on the true individual level. And if it were a utility, there can be many constructs that are created that it would be more like the FLOC, the Fre Federated Learning of Cohorts system, that would be much more contextual. It's not a really great fix on that, I understand. <laughs> but that's where it could be more along the line. So you have a very large denominator, you're, hel you're held within the flock, and therefore that data is not as personal as you think, moving into a different formation. So jumping into, like, I think uh, you both bring up some interesting points there. I'm thinking back to the, the recently unredacted lawsuit that uh, more than a dozen attorneys general in the US yes. are filing against Google, uh, and, and in the, it's about a 150 page lawsuit, they talk about how Google is allegedly, because you know this still hasn't gone to court yet, but uh, is is you know colluding with Facebook, and they're you know, they're trying to uh, fix rates, you know, and have higher take rates for for header bidding and stuff like that. So it's it's interesting thinking about the 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 energy metaphor, thinking about utilities and, and how those are run, and there's regulation around these utilities, and so. I'm kind of curious, I don't know if anyone wants to weigh in on this lawsuit, if anyone's read it or not, but I'm kind of curious when you're thinking okay. about this company that has thrown its weight around, again, it's an antitrust suit, uh, you know, does it need to be regulated in the same way that uh, a utility runs, and I know you guys have been pointing that a little bit, but Brendan or anyone else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I said this on Twitter, it's known that uh, Brave got subpoenaed, DuckDuckGo got subpoenaed by the DOJ last year. We then got subpoenaed by Google, I believe they did too, Google's lawyers, really, and DOJ sent a matching subpoena so they could play referee to try to see what was being asked for, which was way too much, of course. Uh, but Google has done what Microsoft did, you know, and was convicted of 20 years ago. They've, they've tied things together across markets to take a monopoly they naturally acquired in one market, which is search, and in Microsoft it was the Windows operating system, and to conquer adjacent or new markets that they didn't have strong products in. Uh, and this shows in all the, the privacy problems that they have, all the price fixing, which is a felony in the U.S. If, under antitrust law, uh, alleged, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 AMP, accelerated mobile pages, ads being made artificially fast by slowing down non-AMP ads. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot of dirty laundry that came out two Fridays ago in the unredacted document that a judge forced out. Um, and it's, it's not pretty. Uh, and I. I would like to agree with Chris that people are not resources. People are not, data is not oil, it's not pork bellies, it's not this interchangeable commodity. You can take 
sweet like crude from here and there, and if it's not fraudulently sold to you, they're interchangeable. You can refine it and make gasoline. You can do it with pork bellies too, ideally, but you cannot treat data from people as a commodity. It's not a commodity, it's not electricity. What happens with electricity is interesting. In California, and notoriously Texas, they tried giving people smart meters, and they had this fake model where people would freeze in the dark when prices went high just to avoid getting huge bills. People do not want to freeze in the dark. The same thing happens with privacy. People do not want to be abused by these platforms or by unknown third parties that predate on them, that prey on them, prey upon them. But I think there's a lot of issues, and some of the issues that I feel like it are, are driven by COVID, right? How many of you guys gave your phone number, email, uh, and your name after you arrived here, right? I have given my name and information out at least four times. Where is that information going exactly. at the end of the day? Who has it? Because I will tell you, in the last two months, I get hit up more on spam, on text messages, emails, and phone calls than I've ever actually did. And so I don't think this is a small problem. I think it's a much larger problem. And our data is out everywhere. And I don't sign consent in giving that information to anybody right now, and neither do any of you. There's restaurants collecting it, movie theaters collecting it. There's everybody collecting it. What is happening to that data? And we've given it away for free. So it's, it's interesting to think about that, because you know, you've talked about you know, maybe the things that people have have or haven't opted into, right? Um, and then thinking about earlier, you brought up that people advertise on Google and Facebook because they have the scale. And then, yeah. you know, there's a, of course, there's also the discussion around the open web and a lot of the ad exchanges and stuff like that. And so it, the, the, the industry's become so fragmented. And so there's been this discussion lately about this movement towards first party data and having either publishers or brands own more of that. Uh, does that seem like a viable solution? Uh, I know that there are some ad tech companies that are trying to do this and having their own form, like whether it's uh, you know, uh, the trade desk with its idea or whatever else, but I'm kind of curious, what, what is the solution? Yeah. So um, obviously consent is an important part of you know, proper data management, but I think, um, I, I don't know if anybody's been to like an illegal rave. Um, <laughs> of course I haven't. <laughs> Um, but uh, when, you, when you go to somewhere where there's an unsafe building or there's too many people, even if you're consenting, even if you want to be there, the fire inspector comes and says it's not safe. And so I think focusing just on consent is not the right way to think about proper data management. I think we have to think about risk mitigation. And actually thinking about frameworks of safety, consumer safety and risk mitigation might actually give more leeway for companies uh, if we had proper regulatory frameworks that said, if you do risk assessments according to this framework, you might be able to use this data without always having to get opt-ins if the risk is really low, with the caveat saying that a public regulator would then determine what, what is appropriate and not. So I think when we're talking about things like privacy or safety and all of this, we don't necessarily have to you know, pitch the, the industry against privacy advocates. I think we can come to a common ground solution where there's flexibility for advertisers, there's flexibility for companies, but at the same time operating within a context of consumer safety and risk mitigation. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And I wish we could keep going on that thread, but unfortunately we're already out of time. So um, this has been great. I wish I had another million questions we could ask, but we'll end it there. Uh, and thanks again for you all for joining for this and uh, enjoy the rest of the website.